Hey, thanks for checking out Next Level Carpentry. I'm standing in this small but efficient mechanical room, which probably isn't what you expect for a video about building a classy little loft ladder. But uh, the fact is that this uh, mechanical room is also access to the crawl space of this home. And I need to get in and out of this crawl space quite a few times uh, during the remodel process. The plumber, electrician, heating guys got to get down here. So I want to make access pretty quick, pretty easy, and relatively safe compared to just jumping down in a pit and then doing gymnastics to get out. When I got here, uh, this was just a plywood panel slapped down over the hole. I took the panel to the shop, belt sanded it, uh, trimmed it nice and square, cut it in half, and then put this recessed handle in it. so that it can be lifted up and out of the way easily and then not get lost or turned around during the construction project. I added two continuous hinges to the panels so that this easily hinges up out of the way and can be either opened or closed effortlessly. The current system for access is either just jumping down in the hole or using this flimsy little fold up step stool ladder that got stuck down in the crawl space. Up until now, I've had to jump down into the hole and then do a parallel bar move to get back out. And I don't want to have to keep doing that for the next four months. Uh, the little step stool down there is an improvement. And I could probably just get another one that's similar and taller, but it's still going to be a little flimsy and not really permanent. You can probably see it. There's a, uh, a flat, smooth concrete slab down here in the crawl space, which is really nice. This joist is removable. Uh, if the furnace needs to be replaced, the joist comes out and get something bigger out of this crawl space. Um, and I moved it over so that I've got 21 inches of clear space in here. So that's the width of the ladder. And the only other real critical measurement is the total rise, the height from uh, the subfloor plywood down to that concrete. And that measures exactly 45 and a half inches. The total run of uh, the ladder or the distance it goes out as it goes down isn't quite as critical, but if I get it too far, it's going to make the space to get through too narrow. And of course, the shorter it is, the steeper the ladder is, and the less uh, usable it'll be. So I want the run to be kind of a happy medium, but I'll just determine that with the layout and the plan for the size and angles of this loft ladder. But for now, I'll just take those two dimensions back to the shop where I can set up the camera and show you how I do uh, the plan and layout for making a loft ladder. I'll actually build the ladder in the shop also because I don't want to bring all the tools that I'll use to make it here to the job site. There's no reason for that. So let's head back to the shop and I'll go through the layout process so you can see how that's done. Back in the shop, this project starts out like many other projects I do. And that's with a lot of head scratching and pondering. But once I've uh, gathered up tools, I can go to work. And keep in mind, this isn't a video about math. It's not a video about safety code. It's a uh, video about practicality and making a quick set of uh, steps or um, a short ladder to get in and out of a crawl space more quickly and more safely. So I've gathered up the tools I need. I've got a sheet of material that's tall enough to uh, show the whole uh, set of steps in full scale and it's wide enough for the same purpose. Uh, I've got a carpenter's framing square, tape measure, paper mate, Sharpie pencils, click readers, reading glasses, which I can't seem to do without, and last but not least, a giant eraser that I can use during the layout process as I go through different iterations and proportions for this set of steps. I keep saying steps and ladder and stairs, whatever, uh, but this is how I go about the layout process. For this little ladder, the most crucial measurement is the total rise, which is the height I got on a job site from the concrete slab in the crawl space up to the top of the three quarter inch subfloor in the mechanical room. And that was 45 and a half inches. So I'll lay that out here. 45, one half total rise. For this little ladder, that total rise is really the only crucial dimension. The total run is variable. Uh, I don't want it too long because it'll restrict access into the crawl space. And uh, the shorter it is, the harder it is to get down. So I'm going to pick something in the middle. But like I said, the total rise is the most important uh, dimension. Got to get that right so the steps are even. And like I already said, this isn't a video about math. It's a video about practicality. So I want to divide up this total rise into equal increments. And I'll shoot for something around eight inches because that's a comfortable step. But rather than get out the digital calculator, 
I'm going to use a tape measure for an analog calculator to divide this up really quick. If I was a math whiz, I could easily divide 45 and a half inches into equal increments. But the simple way is to pick a number that is easily divisible, that's close to 45 and a half inches. So I'm just going to run my tape measure out here, hooking on the end of the plywood and then putting exactly 48 inches on the total rise mark. I know that 6 eighths is 48, so I can easily divide this up into six spaces equally by marking eight inch in intervals along the edge of this tape measure. 8, 16, 24, 32, 40, just like that. Each of these marks is the level of the top of each of the steps on the ladder and they're evenly divided out at about seven and five eighths inches, give or take. They're equally divided, but I don't know what the exact fraction is because it could be something in sixty-fourths of an inch. And for all you metric guys out there, I understand that dividing centimeters and meters is all a lot simpler in base 10 than it is with these fractions, but I'd still use the exact same process to do this, whether in imperial or metric. Next, I'm gonna guess on a run for each step, and um, I'm thinking that six inches will work it won't make the ladder too long, so it'll be hard to turn a corner in the crawl space. But once I get this laid out, I'll take the pattern back to the job site, make sure I like everything, and I could change it if necessary before I actually make the ladder. But for now, I'm just going to lay out uh, six inch increments starting at the back edge, uh, which will be the plumb line uh, of nosing or whatever of the opening in the crawl space. And I can put a mark at six inches next to each of the hash marks I made, uh, dividing that up before. 6, 12, 18, you can see it hitting this line here. 24, and 30. And now to establish the nosing for each step in this scenario, I just cross these two layout marks for a point that will represent the top outer edge of the step. And now if I've done my math and lay out accurately, all those cross marks will be in a perfectly straight line, which is the line of nosing for the ladder. Starting at the top edge of the plywood and extending all the way down to the concrete slab in the crawl space. And that process, ladies and gentlemen, quickly gives me an angle for this set of steps, which in this scenario is about 51 degrees. When I'm doing this process without a camera, it takes less than five minutes to get this full scale layout. The reason I like it is all the angles and dimensions and proportions are built into the full scale layout. So I don't need to do any math for calculations. I can simply measure points on the drawing and cut the pieces to fit. So I know the finished steps will fit and work as planned. With this initial layout done, I know the parameters that it's gonna take uh, for wood to make these steps. Uh, I'm questioning whether I'm going to be able to get away with the six inch run on the steps. So I'm not cutting anything to fit this yet until I take this back to the job site, drop it down that crawl space hole and make sure I like the way everything fits. I've got to go to the job to do some more tear out today. So that's no problem. I'm not making a special trip just for that verification. But I have a general idea of how long the two uh, stringers are going to be. Uh, the steps are a given width because this thing can only be 21 inches total width and I'll show you how I end up with that in the build process. But for now I'm going to take this uh, collection of uh, Doug fir 2x4s that I got and I'm going to mill them down to make nice lumber for this. Uh, I couldn't get a nice fir 2x6 uh, or a 2x8 so I got the 2x4s. I'm going to mill them and glue them up so they have nice pieces for the two uh, side pieces and then nice sturdy steps for this. So I'm going to work on that and I'll come back to the process of uh, finishing up the layout and then show how I use the layout to create the parts and um, the way that I go about doing the joinery and assembling this ladder. And with an hour or so of milling, joining and glue up, I end up with some really sweet dug fir lumber for building this little ladder. No, there's not a tunnel from my shop to the crawl space here. I'm just messing around. Um, the sheet of plywood that I used in the shop for the layout uh, was too big to bring here to the job site for kind of a site fit testing. So I did the same layout on this sheet of material. Uh, this is too dark for you to be able to see the pencil lines, but it fits down in this hole. So I'm just gonna drop it down here 
and see if the proposed layout, angles, etc., and clearances are going to be practical here on the job. Well, it's about uh, impossible to get a camera angle on this that's meaningful, so you kind of have to take my word for it. Uh, the layout with a six inch run for each step ends up with the bottom of the stairs here. So if I was standing on the, the bottom step here, it'd be pretty difficult to get off of the ladder and down into the crawl space, especially if I'm carrying any tools. So as I suspected, the six inch run is gonna to be too much for this constricted space. So I'm gonna dial back the run so that the last step is about 24 inches from the back and that'll give room to get around the end of the ladder and into the crawl space. I could have anticipated uh, the maximum run and done the original layout accordingly, but I think it's good to go through these steps to see how all these factors can be adjusted to make for the best design and function at the end of the day. And this is what using the new steps will be like with a total 24 inches run for the bottom step. And that's not too shabby. So that's what I'm gonna go with for the new geometry for this access ladder. So you can see the upshot of that test fit on site of the uh, template was that the stairs stuck out too far. In other words, the run was too long. So instead of the 30 inch run that I had with this uh, six inch run for each step, I'm gonna back off the total run to 25 inches, which will change the angle and make uh, the stairs or this um, ladder more uh, functional in the final design. So I'll use the same analog calculator to refigure the individual run by drawing out a line at 24 inches, which will be the total run. This will be the top nosing corner of the bottom step. And I wanna divide that by five. So this time I'll just run the tape to 25 inches on that line and mark off five inch increments on the edge. 10, 15, 20. And so those marks at approximately four and three quarters will be the final run for the steps. So it can end up at 24 inches. And here again, this is not a math lesson. It's a lesson in quick functional layout and planning for a short loft ladder for crawl space access. Now I just extend these lines to come up with a new line of nosing. The line of nosing starts in the same place, but ends in a different place at a different angle. So I'll retrace that line for planning purposes. You can see the difference of the angle now that I've shortened up the total run, and that will change the angle of our little loft ladder from 51 and a half up to 57 and a half degrees, near as I can tell from those little marks. And that's way too steep for a set of stairs, but for a ladder, it's gonna be a comfortable, effective angle. Now that I've got all these stair tread points on the line of nosing, I'm gonna lay out the actual stringer so that I can cut it to size and shape. From the line of nosing on the steps, I wanna have one inch of stringer sticking above it. So I'll just draw a parallel line here at one inch. Like that. And then I line up a piece of my finished Doug Fur stringer stock on that pencil line and then trace out the width of that stringer stock on the pattern, just like that. So this part here will be the exact stringer width, and that happens to be six and three sixteenths of an inch. By the time I got done milling, my little treads or steps ended up being an inch and five sixteenths thick, and I made them exactly five inches wide. And I took an end cut off of one of the treads, and I'm just gonna trace it out here on this pattern so you can see how this all lays out. I'm gonna do a little detailing here at the bottom end of the stringers. If you remember the picture from the crawl space, the farther out the stringer extends, uh, the more there is to trip over. So I wanna shorten that up as much as I can. So I'm gonna continue this little uh, one inch projection uh, that comes down along the angle of the stringer here. I'm gonna wrap it and return it straight down to the floor. And I'll do that by cutting it off here at one inch, and then adding it back on the back of the stringer for, to make it sturdy by making this vertical section six inches wide. This will make more sense when you see me actually cut these pieces and build it than it does here and now. I've got one small edit to do here at the top of the stringer where it meets the top of the finished floor and that is to cut this down three quarters of an inch on the site 
And this layer right here is the three quarter inch subfloor and it doesn't come all the way to the stairwell opening. So I'm going to cut the stringer at this mark right here so that it doesn't make a little nub that would keep the crawl space hatch from closing all the way. These rectangles represent the end of the treads. They're consistent all the way to the top. But this top one, because of the stair geometry, instead of being a full five inches, it ends up at four and three quarters, which is actually the individual run for the set of steps. That's kind of deep into stair design and theory, so I won't get into it. Just take my word for it. The top one's a little bit shorter. So this pile of wood over here, uh, this is enough to make the five little stair treads. These two pieces are the stringers. You already saw one of those. And the takeaway from all this is that I'm just showing a process to make a custom designed set of stairs for a specific installation. There'll never be another set of steps like this in the world ever, uh, but the principles that I'm using for uh, fitting to the site, making the steps fit site conditions and the function that's required, this is a good way to do it. I could build this model in SketchUp and get every single detailed dimension and angle on here, but for this kind of project, it's just more straightforward to do it like this. I can just take it right to the site, take the pattern to the site, make sure everything fits, everything works, everything makes sense. And then with the template that I know fits on site, I can build the steps to this. I'll take them over uh, back to the site and screw it in. Everything's good. So that's a different process. If I was manufacturing these stairs and doing 10 of them, the whole process would be different. If I was making them to fit a set of parameters and not site conditions, I would probably do the design and sketch up come up with a plan and dimensions and build to that. But as it is, I'm planning, building and designing to a template. Hope that makes sense. So with the, the layout done here, this section is the finished pattern for what's, uh, what needs to happen. And these are the two stringer pieces. So basically I just lay them out on here and cut the angles. And I have two identical stringers that fit this pattern perfectly. In millwork, there's always an A piece and a B piece. And I always want the A piece to be most, vis uh, most visible in the final installation. Coming down this uh, set of steps, the inside of the right side is gonna be the most visible. So I'm using the A end of the A piece at the top. And he, the first thing people see is that. Uh, this is the B piece. There's a couple little knots near the bottom and the edge, but this end of it is good. So this is the top. This is the inside of the B face, which will be the left going down the steps. I make notations on the wood so that I can keep track of things as I go through the process. But for now, this is the top of the inside of the right side. I'm just going to flip this over onto the template, clamp it in place so I don't bump it. Then I can use a sharp pencil to mark the underside of the board on the template because that's the surface of the concrete slab in the crawl space. The top end of the string around the pattern, I'll mark this plumb cut underneath here to the template. That'll fit against the vertical pieces of the framed opening. And I'm just going to use this small thin square to mark the top cut of this so it's uh, even with the top of the TJI and not the top of the three quarter inch plywood. And that cut will be a level cut here. And when I cut the mark on the back side, there'll be a perfect 90 degree corner right here. With precise layout marks made, I can unclamp this piece. And you can see the marks for the cuts on the back side, the two horizontal cuts I can make on the miter saw because they're the complement of 57 and a half, which is 32 and a half. And then I'll do this plumb cut uh, some other way, maybe with just a circular saw. I don't, know, I don't have much call or need for a sliding compound miter box, but if I had one, I'd be using it here and now to make this long cut at a sharp angle. But with a steady hand, I can get it more than good enough with this little circular saw. And that battery, just about dead. And those three quick cuts uh, give me the stringer looking like it needs to. Level cut on the bottom, a plumb cut, and a short level cut on the top. Now I need to modify the bottom end. I talked about having this little triangle cut off because it would be a toe tripper. So I need to transfer the mark for this one inch projection onto the stringer. With the stringer positioned in place perfectly, I just transfer this mark just right here. And that's a plumb line, which is square to the bottom cut. This needs to get cut off. I'm going to use the miter box to cut this because I want a nice clean line because I'll reuse this piece when it gets glued on the back. 
back at the template. You can see where the stringer is going to sit, just like that. This edge will be one inch ahead of the nose of the step, and then this offcut will just get glued back here. Even though I've invested a fair amount of time into cutting and milling these parts, getting them measured, marked, and cut to size, uh, I do that with confidence. Uh, I'm not nervous about it at all because even if I measure once and cut twice and a piece ends up too short, I don't have to worry about it. I can just run them through the DeWalt BS1000 that's parked over there, stretch them out, cut them again, and continue with the project. Sweet as a self licking ice cream cone, right? So now I can use this stringer as a pattern for the other one, making sure that I have a left and a right for uh, the visual respects of it. And then I'll get this piece glued on here before I move into the process I use for mortising for the treads. This is just routine carpentry. I'll use a couple of joining biscuits in here and a clamp, uh, nothing to that. And I'll come back to the video when I've got both of these pieces made and ready for the treads. This is what the stringers look like when they're all glued up. They'll stand like this going down into the crawl space, like that. Um, they're all fit to size, uh, cut to shape and everything. And then over here are the treads. I made an extra one. I need five. I got six. And these need to get attached uh, to the stringers in between, obviously. Um, these get done a lot of ways. In a typical stair, uh, the stair jack is cut out with a notch, but that makes what's left over too weak. In ladders like this, a lot of times a groove gets dadoed through there and then the step fits in that groove, but I don't like the extra groove on each side. There'd be a groove all the way through and the step only fills part of it. I don't like the way that looks. So I'm gonna mortise these in. Uh, first step will be to put a tenon on the end of the treads. These are 19 inches long, which is uh, a half inch wider than it needs to be for the finished stairs when these are 21 on the outside there's 18 and a half in between. I made these 19. So I'm going to put a quarter inch tenon on each end of all these treads, which is pretty much routine millwork. And the coolest part of the video, in my opinion, is uh, the mortising fixture that I'll make for making the treads fit in here. And that'll be next. I'll set up the mortise on an end cut off of one of the treads, laying them out at a quarter inch deep. And I'll come in a half inch from each edge of the tread head, like that. This little bit gets notched out of each end of all the treads. I'll set the blade depth off a pencil mark, which is plenty accurate for this application, and then set the fence for the length of the tenon. And I'll guide these through with a miter gauge and a sacrificial fence. Since all the treads are identical size and length and all the tenons need to be identical, I just clamp them accurately together and gang cut them. The miter guide and the rip fence help line everything up precisely so that all the tenon cuts are the same. Then I reset the blade depth and the fence to finish notching for the tenon. And I dialed in that fence to get a nice clean and square tenon. And once the setup's complete, I finish all 24 tenon cuts with four quick passes. And I end up with perfectly formed tenons and a handful of Dugfer Dentine. I intentionally make the tenons first so that I can make the mortise match the tenon. It's just simpler that way with this process. And because every tread and, and uh, every tenon is identical, I make one template for all the mortises. Pretty slick, we'll do that next. I'll make the template out of this piece of half inch white white melamine. Uh, any half inch material works good as long as it's fairly dense in the middle. The first step for making the template is to cut a piece of this melamine that's as wide as the tread is thick. So I just set the fence to the tread thickness and rip a piece of melamine off the edge of my scrap. And then I cut the rest of the scrap roughly in two for the other template parts. Then I chop the strip of melamine roughly in two on the miter box. And making this template is so easy, it's almost like cheating. And actually, it is cheating, because I get to make the mortises with a router and not a mallet and a chisel. I've got my handy Starbon CA glue caddy here, and I'll spritz the inside edge of these two pieces of the template with activator. And then add a generous bead of medium Starbon CA glue to one edge of this strip, and stick it about there. 
Next, I add CA glue to the other half of the strip, like so. Place the tread mortise there. Take the glued edge of this, bump it into the mortise, and slide it together, holding everything firm for a few seconds, like that. Then I just add CA glue to this side, here and here. You can see I'm using plenty. It got all over my table saw top, but that's all right. Drop this down and glue that together. Give that a little more time to set up. Just like that. Some of the CA glue leaked out the back because I used too much. I'll just accelerate that so I can scrape it off. This little hide razor scraper is one of the better ones I've found. And because my table saw top has got a coat of wax on it, that glue comes right off of there. And I can get it off the back of the template pretty quickly too. And I don't know about you, but I think it's pretty sweet how quick and accurate I can get a perfect mortising template for these treads with a scrap of melamine and a little CA glue. Referring back to the full scale layout drawing here, remember that I want the uh, nosing of each tread to be one inch down off the top edge of the stringer. So I can draw that layout line on the actual stringer for setting up this template. I'll set the template up on the back side of the stringer so I don't make confusing marks. But I'm just going to put a line one inch in from the edge, like so. That'll be the actual line of nosing. And then I'll use this protractor that's set up at 32 and a half degrees to show the angle of the treads so that they'll be perfectly level on the final installation. Now I'll take my sample tread and use it to lay out the mortise, remembering that it's the line of nosing that lines up on this pencil mark, not the mortise. The mortise will be set back. So I'm putting the corner of the tread right there and marking the mortise there and there so that the tread comes out here. So the mortise will look like this. I'm just using this little square thing here to draw a line. That's the mortise there. A big X shows me what needs to happen. And then I can just look down through the mortise template and line up all the pencil marks like that. And once the template is perfectly lined up, I'll clamp it in place with these large C-jaw vice grips. The large C-jaw vice grips allow the clearance for me to slip in a guide fence and a larger pair of C-jaw vice grips. Allows me to clamp that fence in place under the template so that I can quickly use a snappy bit to pilot some holes and run in a couple of inch and a half square drive screws to hold this whole thing together. Just like that. So this template is perfectly sized to the mortise on the treads. The fence gives it that one inch offset off the top of the stringer so I can just slide it up and down into position for routing the mortises. And it doesn't take much imagination to see how that mortise can be placed anywhere uh, vertically on the stringer and that once it's routed the treads will fit in there perfect and snug every time. I'll do one more thing to this template before I put it to use. I just draw a line and rough cut off this excess material on the template with a saw and then flush trim it with a router. This helps flip the pattern over for doing the left and right stringers, which will become a little more clear later. Removing that excess material makes it easier to clamp the template to the stringer for the routing process. The next thing I need to do is transfer the tread location marks from the template to the stringer. So I just line up the stringer on the pattern and transfer sharp, crisp marks from the pattern to the stringer using this little general angle finder square and its handy rectangular pivot plate. An X marked on the stringer assures that I route the mortise in the right location, which is below the line, not above it. With tread location marks in place, I just flip the stringer over and extend those lines out across the face of the stringer using the Sterrett protractor set to the 32.5 degree angle. Next, I mirror the two stringers, carefully lining up the ends, and then transfer the tread location marks from one stringer to the other. The template is set up for doing the left-hand stringer, so I'll route those mortises first. And I like to always check and double check my work, and I'm doing that here by seeing if the lines on the stringer and the lines on the pattern uh, line up. And I want to stress that point of always checking your work because at this stage of the game, it's really easy to make very, very accurate mistakes. Uh, the simple one here would be 
to uh, route the mortise above this line instead of below it, um, route out the back side instead of the front side. So pay attention to detail because there's nothing more upsetting than ending up with some perfectly accurate mistakes at this point and having to start over again. I'm using a nice little Freud top bearing flush trim bit. This has got, I think it's a 5 8 inch cut diameter and about a half inch cut length. Quarter inch shank in this little Bosch router. It works great for a small mortising job like this. Making sure the router is unplugged, I set the depth of the cut with the bit protruding through the template and then just ever so slightly deeper than the length of the tenon so that when the stringers are assembled, screws pull the tenon shoulders tight to the face of the stringers. Here I'm going a skinny 1 32nd of an inch for that snug factor. It's easy to get distracted while shooting video and make a dumb mistake. So I'm just going to do a test run of this template mortising process with a scrap of the stringer. And that's a pretty nice looking mortise for the few seconds it took to make it. And you can see I've got a conflict here. The four corners of this mortise are rounded and the corners of the tenons are square. So I can either round off the corners of the tenon or square out the corners of the mortise. And I choose to square out the corners of the mortise because I've got this great mortise squaring chisel here. This is made for door hinges, but it works great for stuff like this too. This little tool indexes to the square faces inside the mortise and a quick tap drives the chisel down into the corner, making it perfectly square really, really fast. I scrape the crumbs out of there. And you can see with that, that I've got a perfect snug fit for the tread. It's stuck in there all by itself with no screws or glue. How sweet is that? I decided to trim off the other side of the template also to make it better for clamp positioning while I'm routing out the mortises on the stringers. Because I've spent time preparing accurate stock and uh, making a very accurate template, uh, going through the process when it comes down to the mortising part is just a matter of clamping this in place and routing out the mortises. If you do your homework up front, the hard part is actually the easy part. And as you can see, routing out the mortises and these stringers is just a matter of rinse, lather, and repeat. When it comes time to mortise the other stringer, I have to flip the template over to reverse the angle in relation to the fence. Because I flushed up the fence and the template, flipping it over is just a matter of reversing the, the pattern on the fence. The location doesn't matter as long as the template and the fence are flush. And that's a very easy switch to make. And routing the mortises on the second stringer is just as easy. And the beauty of this method is that I've only got to line up one mark to keep everything accurate because the distance of the treads back from the top of the stringer is set by the fence and not a pencil mark. And that arrangement makes it easy to get identically matched mirror image mortises on each of the stringers. Naturally, once all the mortises are routed, I go through with my little corner cleaning chisel and square them all up so the treads fit. I want all the screws that hold the stringers to the treads to be perfectly aligned. And rather than doing a bunch of pencil marking on the outside of the stringer, I simply made this guide block out of a piece of scrap melamine and then drilled holes in the locations where I want the screws. Placing the little block in each of the tread mortises, I can quickly drill two pilot holes that are accurately and consistently located. And then I can chase the holes on the backside with that snappy countersink bit. And it'll look like I really spent a lot of time marking and measuring when it just took a few seconds with a pattern template. For next level quality on this little loft ladder, I'm going to use one final finishing touch and take an eighth inch roundover bit and trace out the appropriate edges on the stringers and all four corners of the treads before I put this together. And that'll make this loft ladder 
splinter free and proud. Because this dug fur is kind of splintery, I'm using a technique called climb cutting, which means making a light pass in the reverse direction of the router bit and then following it up in the correct direction at a slower feed rate to prevent these sharp corners from splintering. I route an edge, flip the piece top for bottom, route a second edge, and then flip the piece end for end and repeat the process. For high volume and high production, this flipping sequence is the most efficient that I've found for getting a bunch of work done in a very short amount of time. Before I switched to the climb cutting method, I got a pretty good sized splinter on one of these corners. I think that'll show up. But that's not a problem for two reasons. One is I made an extra tread. And the other one is, remember, the top tread needs to be trimmed off a little bit. So I'll be able to cut that bad edge off. Gotta love it when a plan comes together, right? And since the top tread will be up against the framing, I don't even need to reroute it to get a perfect fit. Ultimately, I'll uh, sand these off, give them a couple coats of a pre-catalyzed lacquer before the final installation. But I'm going to assemble them and take them for a final site fit to get the installation hardware uh, installed and bring it back to the shop for that finishing process. For now, I just select the treads for finish and presentation. If there's any knots or weird spots, I put them on the back or the bottom. I can just tap them into place. And if I did my homework right, the second stringer should drop right into place on the other side. If this was a heavy use ladder in a finished space, I'd probably add a couple dabs of a polyurethane construction adhesive into these mortises during final assembly to eliminate any potential for squeaking. As it is in the crawl space, I'll just dry fit them and screw them together and that'll be more than good enough. The mortise provides more strength than any amount of glue ever could. One tread was being a bit difficult, not lining up in the mortise like it needed to, but once I got that solved, it worked perfectly. And now you can see what this loft ladder looks like when it's all assembled, all held together with a friction fit in those mortise and tenon joints. It's already solid. When I get the screws in, it'll be bulletproof. I used a process similar to the way I drill for supersized pocket hole screws to put a couple holes in the tops of these stringers where an eight inch lag will easily hold the small ladder into place. I started with a three quarter inch spade bit, chased it with a quarter inch drill bit, and then was able to run the Torx lag screw through into the framing around the crawl space opening. And I'm just gonna use three and an eighth by uh, number nine Torx drive construction screws for putting this together. And I drive them into those holes that are already countersunk with that snappy bit. And then I keep the heads just shy of flush. Once the first couple screws are put in each side, I resort to lazy man's way, set the assembly on my rubber floor mat, and drive the rest of the screws. A slight tap with a rubber mallet makes sure everything is snug when the screws are driven. If you look close at this one mortise, you can see a slight impression from the end of the step on the face of the stringer. That's the effect I get because I made the mortises ever so slightly deeper than the length of the tenons. When they're screwed together, pressure from the screw tension when the steps are assembled into the face of the stringer ever so slightly to give me the watertight fit that I'm after. And that ought to about do the job, don't you think? After verifying that I like the way this fits and that the screws hold it in place firmly, I bring it back to the shop for the finishing process. Because I use screws, I can just zip them out and disassemble everything. I use a Sharpie marker to add numbers to the parts so that they go back together exactly the way they did in the initial installation. For relatively soft wood like this Douglas fir, I use my jumbo oops eraser to remove pencil marks before sanding. Otherwise, fine sandpaper just drives pencil marks down into the wood where they show up through the clear finish I'm gonna put on these steps. Because I've done my homework, a very light scrape of the glue joint and a quick sanding of all these ladder parts is all that's necessary before giving them a couple coats of a pre-catalyzed lacquer. 
After everything's cleaned up and sanded, I lay it out in the shop and do a two coat process of lacquering these pieces. The lacquer I use is self-sealing, which means I spray on a full wet coat, let it dry, sand it with 320 grit sandpaper, and then apply a second coat. And you can see the glassy finish I get on these steps when I'm laying that second coat on. It's definitely more than is necessary for a crawl space. But you can see just how nice a ladder like this can look when it really matters. If I've done all my homework thus far on the project, final assembly is a snap. And I'm quite pleased with the way this ladder looks after a couple coats of that lacquer have dried. And driving the last of those screws pretty well finishes the assembly of this loft ladder. And I always like to set it next to the pattern so you can see how the finished product and the pattern line up perfectly. And I think that that really demonstrates how effective this full-scale layout slash pattern method works for fabricating a custom ladder like this. A gates block helps me center up these anti-skid strips on each tread and then I use a J roller to apply firm even pressure to the whole strip so it's stuck firmly and will never peel up during use. Well I guess that's a wrap for this loft ladder build video and you'll notice that all through the video I'm calling it uh, a loft ladder even though it's a ladder for a crawl space and that's just because nobody's searching for a crawl space ladder on YouTube. If you like what you saw in this build video I hope you'll consider subscribing to Next Level Carpentry if you haven't already. It's free and you'll be notified each time a new video is uploaded to Next Level Carpentry. If you'd hit that thumbs up button while you're at it, that rings a little bell over there on YouTube so they know stuff's going on here at Next Level Carpentry. All the tools and supplies that I used for building this in this video are in the video description below. Those are Amazon Influencers links and you get the same low online price for any of those items but Jeff Bezos pays a little bit of his profit over here to Next Level Carpentry, which makes it a great deal if you ask me. I didn't make any mistakes uh, in cuts on the lumber for this, but if I did, I could have just reached for the BS1000 board stretcher. And this t-shirt along with other ones are available at Teespring, and that link's in the video's description also. I want to thank all the patrons on Patreon who've contributed to this channel, gone above and beyond, to help me justify and offset the costs of producing videos so that they can be shared for free on YouTube. There's a link to Patreon down below, as you would guess, if any of you are interested or motivated in becoming a patron to the channel. On occasion, I add patron-only content to that, and that's a feature that I'm trying to develop a little more because I want to go above and beyond for those who have gone above and beyond for me. I guess I've run out of jokes and puns and that sort of thing, so I'm going to Cut this off here and tell you, as always, thanks for watching.